Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And that can be found uh, in your pew Bibles on page 959. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Join with me in prayer. Father, I confess that I am not able in my own strength to cause the preaching of the word to open blind eyes and to unstop deaf ears. I'm not able to cause the preaching of the word to rescue sinners from death and hell and the grave and to build up the saints in Christ's likeness. But you are able to do all of those things. And you do all of those things by your spirit through the preaching of the word. And so I ask that you would work among us savingly, powerfully, for your glory as the word is proclaimed. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I get started, just a couple of notes. Um, Greg Burton wondered aloud whether we'll be playing Twister. We won't be. We won't be playing Twister, uh, which will come as a great relief to some of you, I think. Uh, but I wanted to welcome a couple of folks who are in the congregation today. I met a couple of brothers from Grand Parkway Baptist Church in Richmond, Texas. That's near Houston. And I think they're the first of 18 total. They're going to be coming this week to, uh, to do some work on the campus of our church's church planting and revitalization ministry, the Net Center. So brothers, welcome. Good to meet you. Grateful for you. And I also spied Ben and Katie Wistrom and their son Judah and daughter Chloe. So they've arrived back from Utah, back home uh, for, for them to participate as residents in, uh, in, in Nets, New England Training and Sending. Again, our church planting and revitalization ministry. So Ben and Katie, Good to have you back. Good to have you back home. Look forward to seeing how the Lord might equip you for uh, use for his kingdom here. Well, just a few weeks after Sarah and I married in May 2008, I took a summer elective course in philosophy toward my bachelor's degree in history. I remember that it was kind of awkward. It was my first college course back after taking close to three years off. I was the only balding guy. Back then I still could use I-N-G on the end of that word. Now it's just bald. But then I was balding. I was the only balding guy with a wedding ring on among all the classes participants. And the course was Introduction to Ethics. I don't really remember what the course was intended to be, what it was, was a bunch of 18 and 19 and 20 year olds and our grad student instructor who just kind of blathered on with their profound insights each time our class met. 
And I remembered as I was thinking about the class that there might not be a more insufferable bunch than those who populate an undergraduate philosophy course on ethics. <laughs> In any event, before that course, I'm sure I couldn't have told you what ethics was. I probably would have said that ethics has to do with what's right and wrong and how you go about arriving at that. But that's, that's not quite it. Ethics, I learned in that class and I continue to agree with, instead has to do with what ought to be the goal or aim of one's life. An ethic is the way a person ought to live. And we learned in that class that whatever one concludes ought to be the goal or aim of life, it can't stay in the theoretical realm. A person's ethic must be lived out. For the month of July, we've been thinking about the church. I get questions about the church somewhat regularly, and so I designed this series to consist of messages that would shore us up in some areas where we might need to grow in our understanding as a church, but also to consist of some ideas where we just kind of need a refresher course to keep us going down the right path, the path that we're already on by God's grace. And today, we're thinking about the church and her ethic. We're thinking about the church and her aim, her goal. So unless you've looked at the sermon outline already, do you know what the church's ethic is? If you do know, would you say you know why that's the church's ethic? And what does it look like in your life for the church's ethic to go from the theoretical and to work out that ethic in your everyday life? Well, we're going to get those answers to those questions from the scriptures together. And I'll tell you right off the bat that the church's ethic is identified in Jesus' response to a question that the Savior fields in Matthew chapter 22. From the Lord's mouth, we learn that the church's ethic is love for God and love for neighbor. And so the church's ethic, our highest good, our goal, our aim, our way of life can be summed up in one word, love. That's what Jesus says. Listen to Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So the great commandment in God's law, Jesus said, is to love the Lord your God entirely and to love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that God has told his people to be and to do in the law and the prophets boils down to this. Get this right, Jesus says, and everything else falls into place. And nothing else can be said to be right if this isn't right. Love the Lord your God with your whole person and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'd like for us to spend a minute reminding ourselves what God was saying when he said in his law to love your neighbor as yourself. And to do that, let's go to the third book of the Bible. That's the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And I'd invite you to have both a Bible open and your sermon outline handy. If you didn't get a bulletin, you can access the sermon outline at CMC Vermont dot org slash gather so take your bibles and turn with me to the third book of the bible leviticus chapter 19 leviticus chapter 19 and i'm going to begin reading at verse 9 when you reap the harvest of your land you shall not reap your field right up to its edge 
Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So here in verse 18 of Leviticus 19, we have the command that Jesus quotes in his response to the lawyer back in Matthew 22, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This passage here in Leviticus 19 is the first place in the scriptures where we have this command explicitly stated. So if we can learn what the command means here, it will help us know what the command means when Jesus uses it in Matthew 22. And so take note of the phrases and terms that God uses in these verses here in Leviticus 19. Look with me again in verse 11. You shall not lie to one another. Who's the one another? Well, in this context, it's fellow Hebrews, fellow members of the covenant community under the Mosaic covenant. Verse 13, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. So it kind of looks like the whoever's being referenced as the one another in verse 11 and the neighbor in verse 13 looks like they're referring to the same kind of person. Verse 15, in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Verse 16, you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. In that verse, verse 16, it's crystal clear that your people and neighbor are referring to the same kind of person. Verse 17 also uses brother and your neighbor interchangeably. And then in verse 18, the key verse here, we see the phrase, your own people and neighbor being used interchangeably. What does all this mean? Well, we have to know who Jesus is referring to when he says that the great commandment is to love God entirely and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the question is, is my neighbor in Jesus' mind Every other member of the human race without discrimination? No. My neighbor is whoever is referred to by one another. Your people. Brother. Your own people. Those phrases are all synonymous with neighbor here in Leviticus 19. And they reveal that the neighbor whom I'm to love as myself is anyone who's a fellow member of the covenant community. And in this period we're in presently, this period of redemptive history, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the only covenant community that God recognizes is the new covenant community. That is, those who have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My neighbor... Therefore, whom I'm to love as myself is my fellow Christian, my brother and sister in Christ. So what do we learn from Jesus about what is to be the way his people walk? What's to be our ethic? Well, Jesus defines it for us, or identifies it rather, we're to love God entirely, and we're to love his people, Christians, 
as we love ourselves. Now, when we're looking to define the church's love ethic, where do we turn? It's not really all that helpful for me simply to tell you, you're supposed to love your neighbor. You need to know what that love looks like. And to do that, go with me to the passage that our brother Jacob read earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Bible is divided into two big sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And 1 Corinthians is found in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. And go with me to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13. Now, before we look again at these very familiar verses together, let me just remind you what the Apostle Paul is doing when he writes these words in this chapter about love to those in the church at Corinth. Paul doesn't have marital love anywhere on his mind. He's writing to the church about how to act toward other people in the church. And what he's going to say in these verses to us about love has to do with how Christians are to love one another. Even more to the point, how Christians who belong to the same congregation are to love one another. If you had these verses in your wedding, great. If a husband and wife will love each other with the love that's defined here in 1 Corinthians 13, you're going to have a terrific marriage. But again, it's, it's not romantic love that's in view here. Rather, Paul is talking about how you and I love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. So notice with me what he says in verses 4 through 8a. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It isn't arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful it does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things love never ends so what do we learn about the church's love from these verses how do these verses define how we're to love each other, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, we're to love each other with love that's characterized by patience and kindness. Just, just let those two words, patience and kindness, just kind of roll around in your mind like you might let a fine wine roll around in your mouth and experience every flavor and nuance because patience and kindness are the umbrella terms that the rest of what Paul is going to say about love comes up under patience and kindness what does it look like to love with patience I think the King James translation of this verse helps us and the King James 1 Corinthians 13, 4 reads, Charity suffereth long. So to think about love being patient means love suffereth long. Love is long suffering, which is to say pretty obviously that love isn't short suffering. Do you need to forgive your fellow Christian again? Are they still doing that thing that you've talked to them about that you've told them hurts you? That thing they've apologized for multiple times already? Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. Is your sister in Christ still not as mature as you think she ought to be? Is she still saying and doing stuff that you think by now she ought to have stopped saying and doing? Does she annoy the life out of you is your brother 
a guy you don't even want to start a conversation with because to talk to him is to listen and to listen for a long time. <laughs> Has your brother offended you yet again? Has he sinned against you yet again? Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. <laughs> and love is kind. Paul's going to unpack this. Love from Christian to Christian wants the best for the other, even if it costs you. Love wants the other to shine more brightly. Love wants the other to have his or her own way instead of your own way. Love from Christian to Christian steps over wrongs said and wrongs done. Love from Christian to Christian confronts humbly and tenderly. Love in the church hopes for the best regarding a brother or sister, even in the face of reasons not to hope for the best. And love never says, that's enough. My love account is empty of funds. No. Love for your neighbor never ends. It never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 helps us define this love that is the church's ethic. But have you ever asked the question, why is love the church's ethic? The scriptures teach us that this love we're talking about is the primary indicator that we've been saved, but why is the primary indicator love and not some other virtue? Well, for at least three reasons that I've given to you in your sermon outline. First, because love is the end of God's law. That is to say, love is the aim. It's the goal of God's law. The Apostle Paul makes this clear in Romans 13. Turn with me there. Romans chapter 13. If you still have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 13, Romans is the book just before 1 Corinthians. So go with me to Romans 13. And look with me at verses 8 through 10. The Apostle Paul writes there, Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. The first reason why love is the church's ethic is because love is the fulfilling of the law. We already heard Jesus say something similar, didn't we, earlier in this sermon. Remember, the Lord said that the love for God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and love for God's people is what all the law and the prophets depend on. And now we see from the apostle here that love, and notice verse 8, it's love for each other, love for your fellow Christian. Paul is saying that love is the fulfillment, it's the end, it's the goal of God's law. Christians, we can kind of get the wrong-headed idea that because Christ has perfectly kept God's law for us in our place, that there's no law that's any longer binding on the believer. No. The law-keeping that reveals that God has united us to His Son is our love for each other in the church. You are obligated, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you're obligated in the power of the Spirit and by God's grace to keep the law of Christ, which is summarized by the command to love God entirely, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the fulfillment. It's the end. It's the goal. It's the aim of God's law. Second, the reason why love is the church's ethic is because God is love. In fact, God being love is the reason why love is the end of God's law because God's law reveals his character. And so when God tells us in his word that love is the fulfillment of the law, 
When God tells us in his word that love is the ethic of his people, the chief virtue of those who belong to him, that reveals to us something of God's character and how essential love is to God's character. I want you to see this worked out. So go with me to 1 John chapter 4. That's near the end of the New Testament. 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read a decent-sized portion of chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. So follow along with me, please, as I read. 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now there's a lot in these verses that we don't have time to get to, but I first want to point out the plain statement in verses 8 and verse 16. God is love. Why is love the ethic for God's people? Why is love the ethic for the church? It's because love is the fulfillment of his law. And why is love the end, the goal of his law? It's because God's law reveals God's character and God is love. But I want you to notice too how this passage we've just read together helps us to see why in Matthew chapter 22, that loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and loving your neighbor as yourself isn't two commandments, but one great commandment. It's because to love God is to love your neighbor. Look at verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another... God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Look at verses 19 through 21 again. We love, I think the context helps us to understand, we love each other because God, because he first loved us. Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so, listen, believers, loving God with our whole person and loving God's sons and daughters by faith, loving our neighbor, these ideas are inextricably linked. If you love God indeed, you will love his people. And if you are loving his people, you are loving him. And I think that's a really helpful truth 
for us to hang on to. Because if I just say to you, look, Jesus says you got to love God, you could think, well, how do I know that I'm loving God? Is it because all my car radio presets are to Christian stations? Is it because I, I get really warm and fuzzy thoughts and feelings about God? Is it because I, I talk about God and use a lot of religious talk all the time and I read my Bible a lot and I go to church and I avoid bad movies and bad shows and bad websites? Is all of that how I know I'm loving God? And the Bible actually answers this question for you in places like we have here in 1 John chapter 4. The way that you can know whether you're loving God is very simply, do you love His people? That is to say, are you patient? Are you long-suffering? Are you kind with His people? If you say you love God, but you don't love his people in ways that we're going to see in just a minute. God has a hard word for you through the Apostle John here, doesn't he? He says you're a liar. I want to make sure this connection is clear in your minds. The reason why love for God is evidenced by love for God's people is because we don't yet see God face to face. And until we do, the object of our love is those in whom God dwells by His Holy Spirit. Namely, Christians, my brothers and sisters, my neighbors. That's why our love for God is evidenced by our love for His people, because that's the ones in whom He dwells. If you don't love your fellow Christians, your talk of loving God is worthless. It's lies. Love is the church's ethic because God is love, and He has been love eternally. What God is now, He has always been. From eternity past, the Godhead is love. The Father has eternally loved the Son. The Son has eternally loved the Father. The Father and the Son have eternally loved the Spirit. Don't be confused into thinking that God created mankind so he, because He had all this pent-up love and i got to create somebody who I can have an outlet for my love. No. The three persons of the Trinity have eternally expressed love one for another. The Apostle John records... In the Gospel of John, chapter 17, the prayer that Jesus offers to his Father the night before our Lord is crucified. And during that prayer, Jesus says to the Father, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you hear that? The Father has loved the Son from before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So Jesus acknowledged in that prayer that he has been eternally loved by his Father. When we're talking about God being love, don't get confused that the first place that that was made manifest was in creation. No. The three persons of the God have, e have eternally basked in love one for another. The third reason why love is the church's ethic is because we're being made like Jesus. God is love, and we're being made like his son. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 regarding the father's salvation of his people, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed 
to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You and I, Christians, are being conformed to the image of God the Son who is love. Paul would write to the Corinthians, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That is, just as we were born bearing Adam's image by faith, we will all bear Jesus' image. And so love is the church's end. It's our goal. It's our aim. It's our ethic. Because Christ's image is being restored in us who have believed. God is moving us every moment toward the day when we will bear Christ's image as he has always intended. Not in a marred way as we do now, but perfectly at last. And the one in whose image we are being conformed has revealed himself not just to be loving, but to be love. So it follows that love is to be the way in which we walk. Now before we move on, I want to take the opportunity just to linger here for a few minutes. I want you, Christian, to let yourself bask in the glory of what we're seeing from the scriptures here. Did you hear, believer, what Jesus said when he was praying for you hours before his death on the cross? I'll read it again from John 17. Jesus says to the Father, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus has been loved perfectly by his Father for all eternity. And he says he's made known to us his Father so that the love with which you've loved me may be in them and I in them. What does all of that mean? It means, my brother and sister in Christ, you are loved by the Father with the love with which he loves his Son. And you are loved with that love right now. And it's not lessened by the sins that you've committed today or this past week are the sins that you wish you could forget. And that love from the Father is not enhanced when you have a good streak of obedience. You have been placed in Christ if you've repented and believed the gospel. And so you are right now, my brothers and sisters, you are the object of the Father's love. You're the recipient of the Father's love because he loves his Son and he's placed you in his Son Right now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, do you hear this? God isn't angry with you. He is pleased with you right now without qualifications. No, yeah, buts. No. The Father lavishes His love on you right now. Now, let's just be honest for a second. That's hard to grasp, isn't it? Because we don't really find an analog to perfect love and unconditional love. All the other love you know has strings attached. Or it waxes and wanes. All the other love you know ebbs and flows, but not this love. And the reason why you enjoy the Father's love for His Son is because you are in His Son by faith. Jesus says to the Father that we're loved. The love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And where was that love so marvelously on display? It was on the cross, wasn't it? The first verse, if you have any scriptures memorized, the first verse you probably memorized is John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave 
his only begotten son. He gave him to die on the cross. He gave his only son to be the sin bearer, the wrath-absorbing substitute for sinners on the cross. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for his friends, for his people on the cross. We already read this from 1 John chapter 4, but it certainly bears repeating. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That is, how was the love of God demonstrated? How was the love of God plainly seen that God sent his only son into the world? so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. A propitiation is just a big word that means the one who satisfies wrath and causes us to have peace. Christian, has this love grown a little stale to you? Do you have to think back? Do you have to use the past tense when you think on being enraptured by the love with which the Father loves you? How much can you can you quantify how much the Father loved the Son from eternity past? Of course not. God loved his Son infinitely, and yet he sent his son to those who would reject him. He sent his son to those who would crucify him and blaspheme him. The father sent his holy, spotless son to die for his enemies in the place of his enemies, suffering the punishment that his enemies deserved for their sin, for our sin. And so it's no wonder why we sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. How marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me evidenced by dying on the cross in my place bearing my sin burden he took my sins and my sorrows he made them his very own this is why love namely Love for the people that God specially loves, his sons and daughters by adoption in the Lord Jesus. That's why love for the saints, love for, the, for our neighbor is the church's ethic. It's because we're, we're to show each other, we're to live out toward each other what God has shown us and lived out toward us by his son. And I want to say to you, friends of mine who are outside of Christ, those of you who have not repented and believed the gospel, what about the love that I've just talked about from the scriptures is not enough for you? You... You can search the whole world over. You can search for decades upon decades upon decades. You won't find love that ever even approximates the love that we're talking about right here from the Scriptures, the love that the Father has for His Son and the love that the Father has for those who are in His Son, Christians. You won't find it anywhere. Unconditional, perfect, unchanging, unqualified love, you won't find it anywhere. So those of you who remain outside of Christ, why would you not repent from your sin and believe the gospel? Why would you not call out to God in prayer? God, I know I'm not a Christian, but I want to be loved with the love that preacher was talking about. Please save me. God loves to answer prayers like that. And it's not as though there's some neutral category. Either you're loved by God or you're just kind of in neutral. No. No, dear one, hear me. 
The Lord Jesus says just moments after he says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says, those who have not believed are condemned already. You who are outside of Christ, I'm calling on you to forsake your sin and to believe on Christ, to cry out to him for mercy and grace, to cry out to him to love you, to pour onto you this love with urgency because if you have not believed, you stand condemned right now. And so don't die in your sin. Don't suffer under eternal conscious torment because you stubbornly continued to resist the gospel when it was offered to you. As our brother Hugh reminded us, from the scriptures we can say, here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness like a flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. My dear unbelieving friends, repent and believe the gospel today. Well, by way of application, how is it that we live out this love toward each other that's the result of our being loved by God? How is it that we live out the church's ethic? Well, helpfully, it turns out that the New Testament is answering that question all over the place. But I want to direct your attention to a passage where the Apostle Paul drills down on how to live out the church's ethic toward each other. Now, I've given you a couple of places in your sermon outline, Colossians 3, 1 to 17, and Ephesians 4, 17 to 5, 2. And I'd encourage you to read Ephesians 4 and meditate on it, but much of what it has to say can be found in Colossians 3, so I want you to go with me there. Colossians chapter 3. It's kind of in the middle of the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you remember that book with the little mnemonic device, go eat popcorn, turn to corn. Colossians chapter 3. Now, I'm not going to read the whole of this passage, verses 1 to 17, but I want you to be there, Colossians 3, 1 to 17. I want you to get there in your Bible so that you can put your eyes on some of the things that I want to point out. And the church's ethic is worked out in your life first by putting to death worldliness. What Paul calls in verse 5, according to the translation I'm reading, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. You're to put worldliness, you're to put what is earthly in you to death. You're to wage violent, brothers and sisters, you're to put it to death. You're to wage violent, all out, no holds barred, no mercy, war on the things that work against living out love toward your brothers and sisters. And what are some of those things? Paul's going to describe them. Evil, earthly, worldly desires such as Sexual immorality, sleeping with someone you're not married to, going too far with your boyfriend or girlfriend, committing adultery, viewing things that tempt you to lust, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which we see in verse 5 as idolatry because Coveting is wanting something other than and more than what God wants for you. It's worshiping the creation over against the creator. So living out this ethic is putting to death what's worldly. It's putting to death worldly attitudes. Verse 8, like anger. Again, primarily anger with your brothers and sisters in Christ is in view here. Putting to death heart attitudes like anger and wrath. Wanting to pay them back. Malice. Slander obscene talk, putting to death worldly words in reference to your brothers and sisters. And this seems a good place to say to you that neither gossip nor flattery should ever come from the believer's mouth. Gossip is saying something behind someone's back that you'd never say to their face. And flattery is saying something to someone's face that you'd never say behind their back. And all of that's a form of lying to each other, isn't it? And so is saying to your brother or sister that everything's fine between the two of you when it isn't. 
Lying is not dealing with hurts or nags in the body of Christ. You're to put all that off if you're going to walk out this ethic. And you're to put on, verse 12, godly heart attitudes toward your neighbor. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. These heart attitudes produce the actions that by God's grace our church has kind of been characterized by. These heart attitudes are why people turn out on work days and fill our serving schedule, including nursery and cleaning up the building. These heart attitudes are why people serve in various ministries, putting on compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and, and patience results in people helping the master's family move out of their house on a hot Saturday afternoon and help replace roofs and help build wheelchair ramps and cook meals when people are sick or recovering from surgery or go and mow lawns when a sister is dying from cancer. Where does all of that come from? Those outward actions spring out of a heart that's characterized, that's putting on by God's grace, compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. And Christian, I would ask diagnostically, does that describe you? And you're to bear with one another, verse 13. And you're to forgive one another. Oh, Christian, don't be found being characterized with unforgiveness. When you don't deal with unforgiveness, you've let a venomous snake be your pet. You've decided to let something that will kill you live right up next to you when you let unforgiveness settle into your heart. No, Paul is saying here, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And how is it that the Lord has forgiven you? He's erased your debts. He does not hold them against you anymore. He remembers them against you no more. He does not say in forgiving you, I'm going to let that go for now, but if he does that again, I'm going to remind him of that and the other thing and the other thing, and he did that 20 years ago and he did that 30 years ago. No. That's not how God forgives. Hallelujah. And that's not how you're to forgive anyone. But we're talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. God casts the sins he's forgiven into the sea of forgetfulness. But, but I fear, my brothers and sisters, that many of us can be tempted to cast other people's sins into the sea of like heck I'll forget. No, no, don't let that be true of you. If you aren't forgiving, that's prime evidence that you've never been forgiven by the Lord and are therefore still dead in your sins. Don't, don't be so sinfully arrogant as to think that anyone who's wronged you even remotely compares to your rebellion against the holy God who created you. And he's forgiven you completely. Notice that's the standard by which we're to forgive each other. Verse 13, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And all of that that we've been talking about is under this category of love. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. CMC, I love the things that characterize us. But how is it that we're going to maintain unity and harmony? It's by maintaining love. And how is it that we're going to put on love? Well, in part, it's going to be by putting off what's earthly or worldly or evil. And isn't this how God has loved us in Christ? Didn't he love us in Christ with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience? Hasn't God been long-suffering and forbearing with us? Hasn't he been forgiving toward us? And so, brothers and sisters, our ethic is love. Love is our aim. It's our goal. It's our way of life. Love for God that's lived out in love for his people. 
our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love is our ethic because we're being made like the one who is love. We're being made like Christ. And love isn't to remain in the theoretical. It's to be lived out by putting off sin and putting on the hard attitudes that result in selfless and sacrificial acts toward the saints. Let's pray.